Well, what's up, everybody? Welcome to church today. Come on, aren't you excited to be here? Oh, what a great day to be one church in many locations. Let me look right in the camera and say hello to our Middletown and Hokesson lo locations, including anybody who's joining us online as well. Come on, Newark, would you help me give it up for all of our locations right now? Thank you, Jesus. Well, my name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here, and I have been coming to the journey since 2013 and have been on staff for several years and just so excited that I get a chance to be a part of this today. And my wife, Haley, and I, we first started serving in Journey students whenever we came to the journey. It's where we first got plugged in. And so I just got to do like a quick shameless plug here is that, that on Tuesday, this Tuesday, Converge is happening for our middle school and high school students. It is our monthly gathering that is designed for them to find Jesus. Jesus, and I heard that our after party as part of Converge is going to have karaoke and waffles. So make sure if you are a middle schooler or a high schooler, you come check out Converge at any of our locations. It's happening right here in Newark. So get here, bring a friend with you. And if you're the parent of a middle schooler or a high schooler, I think it's one of the best decisions that you could make this week investing in your students. But for this weekend, I am thankful to Pastor Mark and Susie for giving me the opportunity to be able to teach this weekend. As some of you know, Susie underwent surgery this week on her back and I want you to know that the surgery was successful, but there were a couple of complications. And so they'd like me to ask you to continue to be praying for them and Susie as she recovers. So please continue that. But as for this weekend, we are wrapping up a series that we've been in called I Wish I Knew. And this series is all about the cliche phrases or sayings that our parents told us that quite honestly, they frustrated us or annoyed us in the moment when we were kids, but they have a little bit of truth to them. Phrases like, watch your mouth or stop it, you're fine. Maybe a phrase like, because I said so, or if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you? And for today, the phrase that we're going to look at is money doesn't grow on trees. Money doesn't grow on trees. But don't you wish it did? Come on, don't you wish you could go to your local Lowe's Garden Center and you go in that garden department, you could pick out a money tree. And if you plant it in your backyard, every single leaf on that tree was a $100 bill. How many of you know that's a good day? You're like, this time of year, we're just raking it in, everybody. We're like... You've got like date night with your girlfriend or your wife and you're like, honey, where do you want to go tonight? And she goes, I don't care. And you go, neither do I because I got money from the backyard. <laughs> we all wish we had a money tree and money was something that my family talked about a lot growing up. In fact, it was the number one thing that my dad taught me and I'm, I'm so thankful for my dad for teaching me a lot of the principles of money. He taught me that while it doesn't grow on trees, it does grow whenever you spend less than you make and it grows whenever you put it in savings accounts and things that were very practical and I am very grateful for that. And even though I know a lot of the practical tips and tricks of what to do with money and how to navigate it, I have learned over, over time that I still think about money a lot. And if I can be honest with you, I still stress about money a lot. How many of you would be bold in church this weekend and just say that at some point over the last 30 days, you have been stressed about money? Just can we be honest? All right, everybody look around at all of our locations, look around, hands up everywhere. I think we're all in the same boat here, that we've all been stressed about money. Maybe you don't make as much as you want to, or maybe you're facing some kind of big unexpected expense, or hey, let's face it, maybe you went to the grocery store to get chips for your J group that's happening this week, and you realize Tostitos is $7 a bag. And you're like, what kind of world do we live in? It is literally a corn chip. It's a corn, what is going on in our world right now that this is the case? And most of us, we feel stressed about money at some point in our lives, but I actually read something that was fascinating this week. I read a statistic that said that 65% of Americans say that money is the most stressful thing in their life. 65% of us would say it's the single most stressful thing in our lives. And I think every single one of us would agree we don't want to be stressed about money, right? Right? Like, we don't want to be stressed. We don't want to have it on our mind all the time. But it can be quite hard to see the path towards a fulfilling and content life that God always designed for us when we're so bogged down by all of our worries or anxieties about how much money we make or don't make or how much is in our account versus not in our account, our bills, our debt, 
What are we supposed to do in those moments? Well, what if there was some truth behind that phrase that money doesn't grow on trees, that if we could actually learn it and apply it to our lives, it could actually improve the quality of our lives. In fact, what I'm about to propose today is that we're gonna read a story that Jesus told in the Bible that I think if we will learn to apply the principle that's in this story, I think I'm gonna go so far as to say it can eliminate the worry and stress that we have about money in our lives. I think that's what God intended this story to be in the Bible for. And so as Jesus tells this story, he tells it to his closest followers, to the people that he was friends with, his disciples, but there were other people listening in at the moment. And so I want you to know that if you wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Jesus, hey, you find yourself in the same place as when Jesus was telling this story. And I am so glad that you're here, a part of our church. And I want you to continue to listen in because I think that as Jesus tells this story, there's two things that we're gonna see together. The first is that every single one of us, regardless of what we believe about God, I think can agree with one thing that Jesus says here today. And then I think that there's another thing that Jesus says that for every single one of us, regardless if we're a Christian or not, it's gonna be a hard left turn. And so I wanna look at this together. Let's read the story together. Jesus said there was a certain rich man who had a manager uh, handling his affairs. So I want you to imagine like a Jeff Bezos kind of guy. Like this dude's got a lot of money. And one day a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. You're gonna be fired. Now, right on the front end of our gathering today, I do have to admit that I have a guilty habit. I've got a guilty habit that whenever I go out to dinner with somebody and if I know they're paying, I have been known to get the appetizer and the dessert. I've been known to splurge a little bit. Come on, you know you have to. Be honest in church. How many of you have done this? Y'all are lying in church today is what it is. But... If I know somebody else is paying, I'm like, honey, you want the appetizer? I mean, I mean, it would be rude to say no. Like, it's one of my guilty habits. And that's what the manager in this story has been spending a long time doing. He's been ordering the appetizers and the desserts because he knows it's on the boss's dime. He knows the boss has been paying for it. He knows that the boss is rich. And so the report comes in that the guy's been wasting his money and the boss says, hey, get your stuff in order because you are about ready to be fired. So the manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him a thousand bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here the manager said, take the bill change it to 800 bushels. And so how many of you know, this manager is cooking the books. He's he's finding ways to cheat the system. He's cheating his boss out of money. He's trying to protect himself. And he's thinking, if I can make some other people happy, then whenever I get fired from this boss, they're gonna have a job waiting for me because I helped him out. And the manager, he's basically using his present position as the manager of the rich man's resources to set up his future success in what he wants his life to look like. And I think that's one of the cornerstone things across our world that any financial advisor or any practical tips with money would actually tell you is take your present position and set yourself up for future success. Take a portion of what you have, save it, put it in an emergency fund just in case, or you make sure that you start saving for retirement or something like that. But any financial advisor would tell you that this is a wise thing to do. In fact, the manager, I think he's just trying to be practical with that advice, but in the process, he's cheating the rich man out of what he rightfully owns and what he rightfully deserves. 
And so you would think as you hear this part of the story that Jesus is about ready to tell this guy off. Like he's about ready to say something that you would expect Jesus to rebuke the man or reprimand the manager, but that's not exactly what happens. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. What? Admire? How's that possible that a rich man would admire a manager who cheated him out of thousands of dollars? How does that even make sense? But wait, if you you read this scripture a little bit more closely, you realize that he didn't admire the dishonesty. He admired him for being so shrewd. So whenever I read that word, I had to look it up a little bit because I wasn't quite sure. And so when I looked up the word shrewd, I learned that it means that you are able to judge a situation accurately and turn it to your own advantage. You can judge a situation accurately and turn it to your own advantage. And I guarantee you, you've seen moments of people being shrewd. So if you've had a teenager and they know exactly what to say to get their way with you, they're being shrewd. In fact, if you've ever liked someone, but they were dating somebody else and you put yourself strategically in some environments to realize that you're a better option than them, personal experience, married now, come on, you're being shrewd. We all have some experiences of this and the manager in Jesus's story, he's being shrewd. He takes all the debts that are owed to his boss and he changes them to gain favor with other people. And so here's what Jesus says as a result. Here's what the lesson of the story that Jesus says. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends. When I was a kid, I used to love going to the grocery store that at the very end of checkout, my parents would allow us whenever we were going to buy a piece of candy off the, off the shelves right there at the checkout station. And they would always let us, we'd always have a couple dollars of our own in our pocket. And my mom or dad would say, well, it's your money. Go ahead if you want to buy it. And I remember my dad used to get so frustrated because he knew we were just wasting our money on something that was a piece of candy that would be gone in two seconds. And he knew there was something more practical or better for us that if we would save it or do something different with it, it could actually have an impact on us. And I think that's what most parents really are trying to to teach their kids when it comes to money is that it doesn't grow on trees, so don't waste it on stuff that just provides temporary happiness or it doesn't matter and it'll be gone at the end of the next day. And Jesus, he's trying to teach us the same lesson. I think he's trying to teach us that instead of wasting our money, we should use our money. That money is a tool to be used. It's not meant to be loved or hated. It's not meant to be worshiped or feared. It's whether we have a little bit or a lot, whether we don't feel like we have enough or quite honestly, we're like, I've got too much. I don't know. But Jesus says, use it. That's what the rich man actually admired about his employee that he understood the purpose of the money and he knew it was a tool to be used. He was able to judge the situation accurately and turn it to his own advantage. But what did the rich man or what did the manager use it for? Well, Jesus says the lesson is that we use our money for two things. Number one, we use it to benefit others, to make someone else's life just a little bit better to put a smile on somebody's face, to to offer uh, some help in a time of need. And so let me ask you today, in the midst of all of the different stress or anxiety or worry that you've had about money recently, when was the last time that you used your money, used your resources to benefit somebody else? When was the last time that you used it to make a difference in somebody else's life instead of your own? When was the last time you reached for the check first or you bought somebody a little gift because you thought of them or maybe you gave to something bigger than yourself to meet someone else's needs? We use our money. We use our resources to benefit others. And then the second thing that Jesus says is that we use our resources to make friends, to gain favor with other people as a result of our generosity, Now, let me be clear. What I'm not saying is that money can buy friendships. That's not what I'm getting at at all. But money can buy those $7 Tostitos chips and salsa and queso and guacamole for your J group this week. 
And how many of you know that's a good friend when they show up with all three of those things? You're like, I want you in my life because you have provided my avocado needs because we make friends. Our generosity, our money is meant to pave the way for friendships to be able to happen. But imagine someone walks up with some off-brand Aldi tortilla chips and nothing else. Like, come on, bro. You and I both know that jar of salsa might be 350. And you walked down the street with Starbucks yesterday. Like, we make friends. We're supposed to use our resources to help other people. That's what it means to be shrewd, to use our money to help someone else and make friends in the process. Jesus is saying we use our present position to set up our future success. And then he says this, that then when your possessions are gone, which are gonna be true for all of us, our possessions will leave at some point, they will welcome you into an eternal home. And this is the left turn that I wasn't expecting reading this scripture. Because at first I thought, wait, Jesus, are you saying that my TV and my iPhone are gonna get me into heaven? And that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that when our possessions are gone, when we are fired from this world, so to speak, when our possessions are gone, then there's another place that we are going to go, a place that Jesus has prepared for us, a place that's an eternal home, that we exist forever, that he calls heaven, that he has prepared the way for us. And I think what he's telling us is the condition in which we used our money in this life to benefit others and to make friends has a direct impact on the condition of our eternal lives in heaven one day. And here's how I, I thought about this was we've got a person who's a part of our church and she's just been a sweetheart for years. She has served as a J-teamer faithfully. In fact, she comes in multiple times a week and she's our receptionist in the office. Her name's Miss Barb. And uh, yeah, Miss Barb is beloved around here. And uh, Miss Barb takes care of us in the office. And here's what I mean is that Miss Barb will buy snacks for everybody in the office. And if you know, you know. Like, this is not like some Aldi off-brand tortilla chips, all right? This is like whatever snack you say you like, she buys, and there are cabinets full of snacks for anybody that wants. Many a meal have been replaced by the snacks in Miss Barb's stash, everybody. <laughs> And so for, for us, we're just so thankful for her. And we've got this kind of running joke around the office that one day we think when Miss Barb gets to heaven, she's gonna have this gigantic mansion and we'll all just be lucky if we're living in her shed. Because <laughs> she's so generous. She's not rich, but she's generous. And I wonder if there's some truth to that. That one day, all that she's done with her resources to benefit others and to make friends is gonna welcome her into an eternal home. And I wonder if that's true for us, the condition of our lives, the condition of how we use our money actually determines what comes next. I think that's what Jesus is saying here, that how we manage our money has a direct impact on eternity. And people who don't believe in Jesus, I think they say, hey, you should save or you should spend less than you make. And that's true, that's great practical wisdom. But followers of Jesus also say that I should use my money to make a difference beyond what I experience for myself because one day I'm gonna be dead and gone and this world should benefit from the way I lived my life while I was here. And that's what it looks like to have a different perspective about money. In other words, here's how I thought about it, that money doesn't grow on trees, no matter how much we want it to, but money grows our eternity. Money grows our eternity. Jesus had a different financial future for us than we have in mind. And we need to learn to be shrewd and ask the question, is my money creating the eternal future that I want? Am I using my present position to set up my future success? What if we stopped going further and further into debt to pay for things that only provided temporary happiness? Or what if we decided we're gonna commit to getting in a budget, we're gonna create it and we're gonna stick to it because when we do, we'll know what we have and don't have. And I think quite honestly, that's just a practical way that we avoid a lot of the anxiety that we have about money is when you know where it comes from and where it's going. 
Or what if we decided that instead of giving sporadically whenever we're emotionally moved in the moment, we actually gave consistently, we gave our first to say, God, I'm putting you first in my life. And by the way, there's J groups this semester that are designed to help you get around some other people and learn those practical and spiritual wisdom points to help you grow in your relationship with God. Now, maybe you're thinking, you know what, Brad? Makes perfect sense. I can get on board with that. You're probably right. And I'll tell you what, Brad, I will do all of those things just as soon as I get more money. I'll do all of those things just as soon as I get a little bit of money to start with it. And Jesus says, that's not quite how it works. In fact, Jesus said, if you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? Jesus is saying, if you had more money, you'd probably act the exact same way that you do right now. Want to know how I know that in a practical sense? Look at every lottery winner and NFL player who ended up broke. Just look in a practical sense at every person who thought more money was going to make my life happier. You can Google studies left and right that are done by Christians and non-Christians alike that show the more money you have, actually the less content overall you are. And so Jesus is trying to teach us a principle. I really think at the core of this message, this is an important thing that I think you gotta catch. Some of you have been thinking this is a money message. No, 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 no. This isn't a money message, this is a heart message. This is a message to ask him where Jesus says, hey, where's your heart at with me right now? Because you can get a bunch of money, practical tips and tricks. You can Google whatever you want to get some resources, but there's a spiritual principle here that God's trying to instill in us. Because we always think that more money is the solution to our financial problems, but in reality, Jesus was trying to get us to see that it goes so much deeper than our bank accounts. He was trying to get us to see that if we can learn to manage the worldly wealth that we have or the worldly resources that we have, then God can trust us with the eternal riches, the true riches of heaven. But here on earth, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. These are some tough words from Jesus. No one can serve two masters. You'll start to love one and hate the other. And so if you make your life all about money, it becomes your master. And then eventually when your money goes wrong, you'll start to get mad at God. Why? Because he's messing with your master. God is saying, hey, I actually want you to be devoted to me. Jesus says you will be devoted to one and despise the other. And so if you're devoted to money, you'll start eventually to hate God because he hasn't given you enough. Or you'll start to hate God because he's making you feel guilty for not giving it. And Jesus says, no, no, no. If you're devoted to God, you will start to despise money. And what he means by that is not that you will sell all of your things and your possessions and your resources and give it all to the poor. No, you'll just start to hate the ways that money has made you a slave. You'll start to hate the ways that the anxiety about money perpetuates in your mind and you will start to shift from, I'm gonna devote my life to getting more, to working more hours, to having more overtime, to just scratch and claw, to win the rat race, to keep up with the Joneses. I'm just gonna make all of that my priority. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I don't want you to make more money. I wanna be closer to you. Jesus says, that we will despise our money when it tries to become a master over us. And we have a choice to make. We can either love God and be devoted to him and live in the freedom that comes when we are no longer slaves to what money says. Or we can choose to perpetuate the cycle we've been in for years and years and years. Again, this isn't a money message. This is a message about your heart. 
I do not, this, this just struck me, but I do not personally benefit if you grow from this. My life is not better if you personally take this and go, you know what, that makes sense to me. So I promise you, I'm not trying to twist your arm. I don't have some kind of ulterior motive that I'm trying to manipulate here. I'm just trying to go, this is what God's been messing with me over the last couple of weeks as I've prepared this because one day I wanna be able to put my head on the pillow knowing that God is a rich man who has trusted me as a manager of his resources and I wanna know that I lived my life devoted to him and when I do so, I can be entrusted with more. I can be entrusted with the true riches of heaven and then I can give generously generously and sacrificially and I can put him first financially and I can remember that when everything else is telling me that I should just win the rat race, I can remember that money doesn't grow on trees. I can remember that money grows our eternity. So how can I use my present position financially to set up my future success spiritually? How can I use my money to benefit others and to make friends? Because there's an eternal home that is waiting for every single one of us. When I was a kid and somebody would talk about that eternal home, I always just kind of got this visual of one day whenever I got to heaven, that Jesus, once I met him, he was gonna be like, all right, Brad, uh, let's, let's talk. And the Bible says that we will all have to give an account to God one day. And this is just my visual. If it helps you, I hope it does. But I imagine that Jesus says, hey, Brad, how you doing? I got two lists that we're gonna go over. And in one list is all the things you did right. And in the other list is all the things you did wrong. And how many of you know this list is not gonna be fun to go over? <laughs> Here's what I imagine. If the Bible says that we're all gonna have to give an account to God, then I think Jesus is gonna wheel out this file cabinet and written on the front of the file cabinet is labeled money. And I think he's gonna review those two lists again. He's gonna say, Brad, how'd you use your money? I was the rich man, you were the manager. Were you cooking the books? Or did you trust me? And I think that Jesus is gonna go over that list of the things that were wrong. And he's gonna go, Brad, you remember those times that you ordered the appetizer and the dessert when somebody else was paying? Yeah. <laughs> Which aren't you thankful, by the way, that regardless of what we've done wrong, Jesus' sacrifice paid for all of it so we can have a relationship with God? But I think he's gonna ask me, hey, Brad, remember that time that you bought something to prove something to yourself? Remember that time that you bought something so that you could prove it to somebody else? You posted it on Facebook because you wanted them to know that you could afford the new car, but you couldn't. This is me as I'm thinking about it this week. Brad, were you... What were you thinking whenever you spent all that time stressing and worrying and scheming and trying to figure out how you're gonna make it work? I thought about it this weekend, just thinking about all the times that I've wondered with the practical wisdom that I know about money and I am so, so thankful for the things that I know. I'm thankful to my father for teaching those things to me. And yet I've spent so much time just stressing about it. Wondering, okay, now I've got kids, so now I gotta take care of my kids and they've gotta go to college one day, maybe, so that's gonna cost $4 billion. And my, <laughs> my daughter, she's gonna wanna get married and I gotta pay for that wedding, which by the time 2052 rolls around, that means that that's gonna be $4 billion too. Like, Jesus, would you, how am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to figure this out? I'm, I'm 31 years old, my wife's a stay-at-home mom. How am I supposed to figure this out on a... Was, and I think Jesus is just gonna look at me going, Brad, what were you thinking? There's another place in the Bible where Jesus tells us, look at the birds of the sky. Does not God take care of them? Look at the lilies in the field. Look at how beautifully they are clothed. And even though they are here today and gone tomorrow, how much more will your father in heaven take care of you? So why worry about today? 
Today has enough worries of its own. Why don't you trust in me? And I think that's what Jesus wants to encourage us with today. He wants to tell us that I've got you, that I've got a plan for you, that I'm going to provide for you, that I am a rich man and I can be trusted at my word. And so Jesus, he's gonna wheel that file cabinet up and he's even gonna say, did you use your resources? Did you use them or did you waste them? Did you hoard them? Were you a giver or were you a garter? Did you wait until you were emotionally moved to give or did you do it out of obedience to God because you knew it's what should come first? Did you use your resources to benefit others or to benefit yourself? Did you find moments to be generous even though people didn't deserve it? Did you find moments to take care of other people that you kept your eyes open for someone that's hurting, that's hungry, and you provided for them? It's one of the things I love about our church, that we take the first 14% of every dollar that you give here, it goes right back out into Journey City to meet needs of people who are hungry and hurting in our region. And so when you give here, it immediately fulfills that. It's helping others. It's benefiting others. Jesus is gonna ask me, did you make friends? Were there some other people in your life in your sphere of influence that you didn't buy their friendship, but you found moments to be generous to them and your friendship quality improved? I think what Jesus is trying to tell us over and over again in simple ways this weekend He's telling us that money doesn't grow on trees and we want it to so badly. But he's saying money grows our eternity. There's a purpose for it. Which let me just pause and tell you, there is a purpose for you. There's a purpose for the season you're in right now. There's a purpose for the financial season you're in right now. And the whole purpose, I don't know how you got here, But I do know you can change from where you are here to where you wanna be. And I do know that if you'll change your perspective to my money is to serve me and how do I make what I get? How do I pay my bills? How do I get out of debt? How do I take care of my family? And if you'll make that shift to seeing God has an eternal home planned for me and we use our resources to make friends and benefit others, our lives immediately improve. And I want that for us this weekend. And so if you're here this weekend and you'd say, Man, that just hits home. I want a different perspective of my money and a different perspective of God as the rich man. And then I wonder at all of our locations, would you just be bold and raise your hand? Let me pray for you. Just keep it up, hold it up high for a second. Just say, I want my life to be different this fall. And let's go to God together. Come on, would you join me? Would you open up your heart big to God? Block out every other distraction. Jesus, We come to you today and we know that God, you are the alpha and the omega. You are the beginning and the end, which means that you are here at the very beginning and you will be here all the way through. Every resource under heaven is yours. We thank you right now for what you've given us, whether it's a lot or a little. God, we thank you for our paychecks. We thank you for our income. We thank you for what you're doing in and through our lives. So God, while we expect and desire more, quite honestly, on an income level at times, I pray that we would trust you with the outcome of our situations. This fall, help us use our resources to benefit others and to make friends. And while you let God just speak to your heart for a moment more, I was struck this weekend that as we thought about money grows our eternity, that's not the only thing that was meant for eternity. You were. You were meant for eternity. Jesus always desired from the moment you were created that you would spend eternity in heaven with him. In fact, he's been preparing a place for you all along. And some of you are here today and you've not taken that step to trust Jesus and trust God with your life. But I'm thankful that the Bible says that if you just believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he came and died and rose again to make you right with God. And if you'll confess that with your mouth, you can be saved. 
And so before we go anywhere else this weekend, I wanna take one more moment. And if that's you, you wanna put your faith in Jesus today. It would be my joy and my honor and my privilege to lead you in a very simple prayer to help you do that. So one more time, let's open up our hearts big to God today. Say, Jesus, I'm trusting you with my life today. Forgive me of all the mistakes I've ever made. I believe that you died and rose again to make me right with God. Save me today. I believe in you. And if that's you, while all eyes are still closed and everybody's still focused on God, if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, I wonder all over this location, online, at Hokesson, would you, would you be so bold as to raise your hand saying, I put my faith in Jesus today? It's amazing. I see you. I see you. It's incredible. And then journey together. Come on, can we celebrate all the life change that happens? Come on, all the people putting their faith in Jesus this weekend. Thank you, God. Well, hey, we're gonna wrap up here in just a second. We've got something special that we wanna show you. But first, if you just put your faith in Jesus a moment ago, let us know on that Connect card that was talked about at the beginning of the gathering. We've got a new Believer's Bible that you can pick up at Journey Central on your way out today, and we'd love to help you do that. But we also wanna take a moment and we wanna acknowledge that this weekend is the one year anniversary of our Middletown location, everybody. We're so excited. Our Middletown location has been growing and thriving. In fact, just since our launch day, we have seen 79 people raise their hand to put their faith in Jesus at our Middletown location. So incredible. And Journey, I want you to know that your generosity paved the way for that because in Christmas offerings and Easter offerings, you gave to make the Middletown location possible. So you used your resources to benefit others and to make friends. And we're thankful for that. And we actually just wanna show you a sneak peek of what it's been like at Middletown here over the last couple of months. Check this out. <laughs> 